Hey everyone, and welcome to the first half of my presentation, What is Fremont? This is a part of the virtual education and self-isolation series that the Utah SHPO has been running for about two months now, ever since we had to go back to our homes and work from home due to COVID-19. I'm Elizabeth Hora, public archeologist at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. And I spend a lot of time thinking about the Fremont. So let me start by telling you that Fremont archeology span was very muddy for me for a very long time. I just wasn't able to walk a mile in Fremont hawk moccasins. I don't wanna spend this whole presentation telling you about dates and sites because that's not how I'm able to conceptualize the past. I wanna focus on understanding the lived experiences of past people. And I do this working from an archeological data set to create reconstructions of daily life. I'll have lots of visual aids from real artifacts and archeological sites to show you where I'm pulling these reconstructions from. But feel free to question my interpretations because that sort of questioning is what archeology span is all about. So what is the name Fremont? So this is really the only part of the presentation when I'm gonna talk about calendar dates and things like that, I, I promise. So where do we get the name Fremont? Probably no one who we would consider Fremont ever called themselves that. And the modern descendants didn't come up with this name either. The name Fremont comes from the Fremont River where archeologists first discovered a suite of artifacts that seemed to belong to a culture they had never seen before. At this period of archeological history, we named stuff like pottery types or even cultural groups for the places after they were discovered. Hence, the Fremont River lent its name to the Fremont people. Under the name Fremont, we are referring to an archeological culture that we see throughout the state of Utah or the modern state of Utah. It's, it goes in and out of the borders, but it conforms surprisingly well to the state. We have determined that this is a single loosely associated cultural group on the basis of shared artifacts and other pieces of what we call material culture. Um, people who were Fremont had the three sisters. They had maize, beans, and squash. A lot of people who were Fremont used pottery. Um, some of them lived in pit house villages, uh, like our picture here, or at least it's a slab line structure. Um, and there's a lot of uh, shared imagery in pottery, figurines, and rock imagery. So does this mean that all Fremont people were the same? not even slightly. The name Fremont pulled together actually disguises a lot of variation. So this map is a rough map of uh, different kinds of Fremont rock imagery styles. And I think a lot of people would have questions about this barrier canyon designation down here. I do consider that a Fremont style. Um, across the Fremont world, we see people doing things differently. For example, not all pit house villages look alike. In fact, some Fremont people don't live in villages at all. We don't necessarily think that all these people shared exactly the same ideologies or even the same language, but we believe on the basis of similar iconography and evidence of a lot of travel within the Fremont world, that if you were a Fremont person and you traveled to another distant Fremont village, you would have enough in common with the people there to be able to communicate in broad strokes. So how do we talk about the Fremont and how can we wrap our arms around Fremont variability? I'm going to spend a lot of time, the rest of the presentation in fact, talking about the farmer forager spectrum. This is the single most important thing to understand about the Fremont. And as luck would have it, it is not the most straightforward concept for Westerners. Although the Fremont lived in pit house villages, not all of them lived like that. At any given time, there were people who made a living foraging. Sometimes they were full-time foragers, and sometimes they were foraging on more of a temporary basis. The farmer-forager spectrum has several different implications for how any one Fremont person might spend their day and conceptualize their own future. First, I'm going to examine the foraging or the forager side of the spectrum. So people who move around a lot are considered highly residentially mobile in archeological terms. So if you're foraging, it's, again, it's just a fancy word for hunting and gathering, you're probably pretty residentially mobile since you need to get around to get the plants and animals as they come into season across a landscape. 
this mobility has implications for how you're going to structure aspects of your life, like your home. Are you spending days making a home? Heck no, you're gonna give it a few hours or even better, find yourself a ready-made shelter like an alcove, hole up in there for a few days or a few weeks. Has implications as well for your stuff. What is your stuff gonna look like? Are you carrying around a ton of it? Again, probably not, especially not heavy things like grinding stones. Almost any stone is good for grinding and smashing, so why overcomplicate things? <laughs> you're going to need some lightweight tools like baskets to carry things in. And you're going to need things like chipstone tools that can be repurposed into a variety of tools. So I have pictured here at the bottom, a little uh, th thumb scraper, we call it, they're sort of tiny. And then up a little bit further, I have what we call a biface. And so this is a piece of stone that has been taken from its original location and worked down into kind of a blank, right? It's a blank slate. From here, you can make a knife, you can make an awl, you know, for piercing something. Um, you can make a projectile point, an arrowhead. So it's as light as it can possibly be. People have chipped off all of the extra materials while still leaving a lot of potential for different tools to be made out of it. That's really the hallmark of a forager's toolkit is that biface, that ready made, ready to go biface. So your tools are gonna to be lightweight and versatile. All right, also where you throw your trash has something to do with whether you're a forager or a farmer. Think about it, if you are in a place for just a few days, what are you gonna do with your trash? Well, let's consider that your trash probably consists of chipped stone from those tools you've made, corn cobs, animal bones, and yes, your own poop. And so you probably wanna get that stuff out of your immediate area, but honestly, it might not make a big difference exactly where you put all this. If you're only hanging around for a few days or a couple of weeks, you're not gonna spend a lot of energy on trash disposal. And the last dimension we're gonna look at is storage. You're a forager, you're out all day, you're on your grind. What about the things that you left at home? You probably wanna stash them somewhere so that no one else takes them. Small, scattered storage nooks are probably gonna work the best. Think about if you put all your tools in one cache and then you put all your food in another, if someone steals from you, odds are they're not stealing from both places and so they're not gonna wipe you out completely. You'll always have either food or the means to get food, something like that. So that's the life of the forager. And it's actually pretty great. Um, it's one of the most stable types of living that we see across the millennia here in Utah and across the world. You get a lot of fresh air, you get a lot of health, heart, heart healthy walking done, and you're eating fresh, seasonally available fruits and vegetables. Someone called Gwyneth Paltrow, Goop definitely wants to hear about this. All right, switching over to the farming life. Now, as great as all the foraging sounds, some people do want to live a sedentary life and stay in villages. So when I say villages, this could mean a lot. Oftentimes we see archeological sites that look like a few families with houses nearish to each other. So returning to that residential mobility concept, we consider farmers um, to have low residential mobility. We also call them sedentary. Low residential mobility structures your life and your material existence just the way foraging does. So I'm gonna use these same categories to talk about the texture of a farmer's life. So first up, housing. Just like your home now, you plan to live here for a little while. People would spend some time making a home that's comfortable. And oftentimes for the Fremont, that meant a pit house. No one then had shovels, you're digging this out by hand and the help of your neighbor's hands if you can get it. So very labor intensive housing. What does your stuff look like? Since you're spending all your time in one place, you can invest in making your stuff high quality and high quantity. So you can go ahead and find just the right clay to make your pots. You wanna do that because you're going to be using this pot for a long time, you wanna make it last. You're also gonna be bent over that grinding stone for a while, so shaping it, oops, sorry. So shaping it to improve its function and aesthetic appeal starts sounding like a pretty good use of your time. Um, here also, 
just part of the foraging life, obviously um, cultivated uh, materials, cultivated foods like maize. We do find a lot of maize on um, village or sedentary sites. And this actually might be ancestral Puebloan, but it's either a pendant or a spindle whorl, both of which we tend to find more often on village sites than on um, temporary sites like a foraging site. Sometimes we find them, not often. Um, let's talk next about where you throw your trash. So you and your neighbors really are gonna need to be on your same page about where you're throwing your trash. <laughs> you don't wanna just throw your trash anywhere and you certainly need to get it out of your space because it's going to pile up. Um, archeologists call these trash piles middens and we love them because we dirty. So here I actually have pictured, it's most likely not a habitation because we don't see any pit house structures, but you can see that there are concentrations, AC artifact concentrations all around. And you could sort of see that things are clustering. Um, you know, we've got um, maybe pottery in one area, broken pottery in one area, animal bones maybe along with it, chipped stone elsewhere. Because sometimes these concentrations are also showing the structure of the site, like where activity areas are. So from the garbage, we can find a midden or we can find you know, a chipping station where someone was making things like that. Our last dimension is storage. You didn't spend all that time building a house to not put storage space in there. And since you and members of your family won't really be too far from the house, there's no need to worry about that kind of casual thievery that a forager needs to worry about. So it's going to be in your best interest to make a storage structure large and make it inside your home where members of your family are and can access it. This is a bell-shaped storage pit. It's actually from the Steinacher area. And so when we excavate a pit house and we find the floor, we'll find an opening about this big, big enough for you to get your, your arm in up to your shoulder. And then it flares out towards the bottom, giving you that maximum room to put all your stuff in. So, I know today has been a lot of information, but it's pleasantly consistent, at least to my mind it is. Just like all of us today, Fremont people faced a big question that closed some doors and opens others. Every single person living in the Fremont world had to decide how they wanted to make a living. It's oversimplifying to say this, but the choice kind of just boils down to, do you want to forage or do you want to farm? The path that you choose will, to a large extent, determine the artifacts you leave behind. Everything from where artifacts will find your chipstone garbage to the types of houses you live in. Oh yeah, but I called it a spectrum, right? And then I just talked about the two ends of it, the farming and the foraging. So we'll have to fill in the middle part next time. And filling in that gray area, that's where Fremont archaeology gets really interesting. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week.